Welcome, everybody. My name is Leonidas Kondothanasis. I'm an engineering director at Google in charge of cloud networking. Uh, multiple products following my team. Uh, the one that I'm going to talk about today is our cloud CDN offering. And I hope you're all well caffeinated. This is probably a more technical talk than you might have seen otherwise. So lots of technical details. So get ready. OK, so uh, how is this talk going to be organized? I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, cloud network. Uh, this is not about the CDN. This is the network itself. Uh, the reason I'm going to spend a little bit of time covering is it has affected many of the decisions we made on how we build it, how we built the CDN offering uh, on top of it. And now I want to make you know, that part clear. And then I'm going to move on to the content delivery aspects. I'm going to spend some time talking about the architecture of our CDN, you know, the platforms that we use to build it, and you know, the logistics management, how we make sure that you know, machines you know, stay uh, up, you know, performing well, you know, getting upgraded, you know, replaced, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to spend some time on our mapping system. That is the heart of the CDN. This is the system that decides how users get routed to the right you know, machines and how traffic from those machines get routed back to users. Those two decisions are independent. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit uh, of time on the product itself, uh, like the features that we support and you know, some of the features that we're hoping to support in the not too distant future. Uh, talk about you know, performance and how we measure performance internally and also externally. And finally, close with a small demo showing you know, the benefits of you know, having CDN delivery for a, say, graphics you know, heavy site. So this is a depiction of the Google network. Uh, Google network changes, of course, you know, all the time. Uh, currently, we have 20 regions uh, with compute cycles available in them. So those are places where you can go and get you know, storage, computation, uh, like the whole heavy cloud you know, machinery. We have 125 pops. Those are locations where we run our edge systems and where we do caching. Uh, this is places where you can meet our network. Uh, for private interconnect, for instance, if you're trying to connect your on-prem facility to us. But you know, we use them heavily for our CDN offering. Uh, and you know, 13 subsea cables you know, connecting all those facilities to one another. Uh, it's one of the unique features of Google in that we run a global private network, unlike other cloud providers, which typically run isolated instances of data centers in many locations. We run one global network that connects them all this has multiple advantages. It gives you private connectivity between you know, machines that are running, say, in Asia to those that are running in Europe or you know, the United States. Uh, and we use it heavily as well to do you know, various tricks you know, sort of around traffic routing, you know, GRE, MPLS, uh, to be able to uh, you know, stir traffic that you know, may have entered our network in one location to another location. And we think that that is preferable you know, for serving uh, purposes. Uh, this is another view of our network. This is actually showing the serving locations that we have. There is uh, 90 of those, uh, 90 different cities around the world, uh, which sit on the edge of the network. Those are the ones that we use both for Google and Cloud CDN serving. Um, uh, they are very large deployments, typically multiple petabytes of you know, cache ability. But we have a much larger footprint uh, that sits off net inside ISPs. Um, so there's about 4,000 of those deployments. They tend to be a lot smaller uh, in terms of size. Today, Google uh, traffic is roughly half and half. About half the traffic that you know Google has for its internal properties comes from the on-net nodes. About half comes from the off-net nodes. Uh, performance differences between those two deployments is actually highly variable by country. You know, for instance, in the US, we find that the on-net nodes do far better than the off-net. Some places, you know, sort of like Africa or you know Latin America, you know, the inverse is true. Some places, like you know Europe, the difference tends to be, you know, practically negligible. You know, we don't see much of a difference. Uh, the reason that we have both is we want to have uh, as good a relationship with ISPs as we can. Uh, in many of those cases, ISPs, you know, see benefit in having caches in their network. In other cases, they don't. You know, we play along with you know whatever you know suits them best. So we pick the best interconnect capability that you know, fits our ISP partners. Uh, we're working to make the off-net caches available to Google Cloud. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later. But right now, only the on-net ones are available for the cloud offering. OK, uh, our cloud CDN. 
so we account for a, a, a Google and Cloud CDN. We account for a lot of the internet traffic. Uh, according to Steinvine, Google is responsible for about 25% of all internet bits. 85% of that comes from YouTube. Uh, but the other parts are actually significant, and cloud is the fastest growing part of that traffic. It's growing faster than YouTube, it's growing faster than you know, the other sources of traffic for Google. Uh, we're seeing more than 50% year-over-year growth, uh, demand from uh, over 130 countries. Uh, we have had to deal with an enormous catalog size, so this informed the decisions on how we built you know, those edge caches. The primary reason for that is that the, the most common content that we're serving is video. Video tends to be very large. And user-generated video, which is what we get out of you know, YouTube, is probably the largest catalog. It's multiple hexabytes of you know, data. So uh, as I said before, cloud traffic is the one that is rising the most rapidly. And that's the one where we think that you know, we have to invest the most, heavy, invest the most heavily uh, to you know, help our cloud customers you know, get the benefits of our CDN. And the infrastructure, as I said, is shared between Google and uh, cloud traffic. So we've built our CDN with the following principles. Uh, number one is ease of use. So the, the key innovation here is that we have a single IP for serving content worldwide. Uh, as a lot of technology that goes behind that, I will spend some time describing you know, how that technology works. Uh, why would you know, a customer care? Um, there is, uh, oftentimes, especially for media uh, partners, we found that they want to work with ISPs to either you know, flat rate or low rate or you know, you know, have a deal that allows you know, their content to be charged as part of an ISP contract, you know, like a cellular contract. Uh, typically, ISPs know how to do that only you know, through IP addresses. They want to say, OK, tell me what IP addresses your content is going to come from. And being able to give them one makes you their best friend. So it's very easy for them to configure one IP. This is the content where it's coming from. I know exactly how to deal with that. The more you give them, you know, the more difficult their life becomes. Uh, we made it very easy to activate our cloud CDN. If you're already on Google Cloud, yes, sir. Uh, the question is, can this be an IPv6 or IPv4? The answer is both. You can choose. So um, we have a single uh, click activation on top of our you know, global load balancer. So if you've got you know, your back end you know, sitting inside of Google Cloud and you decide that you want uh, cash delivery, uh, it's a trivial uh, turn on. It's just one click. I will actually show you the configuration page. Uh, we care a lot about security. So by default, uh, all delivery is done you know, over SSL with no additional cost. We have uh, also other you know, programs for you know, configuring certs and uploading them and managing them. Uh, your backends, the ones that you know, live inside you know, the Google Cloud, are unexposed to the internet. So you know, if you bring up you know, your VMs or you, know, you, know, you have a backend you know, storage bucket, by default, that one does not have to be exposed uh, to the internet traffic. The CDN takes all of the connection and then you know, connects through Google's private network to those backends. Uh, and it's got a built-in SYN flood defense. So because the backends are not exposed to the internet, any you know, attack will you know, stop at the proxy layer. Uh, we have sunk the largest you know, attacks you know, seen in the history of the internet, you know, we believe. and. You know, size helps. You know, when you carry about 25% of all internet traffic, you know, it's kind of hard for you to come down. And finally, you know, performance has been another guiding force. Obviously, we care about that internally. We think that latency is critical to the success of uh, web delivery. Uh, we invest heavily on state-of-the-art protocols. So our CDN, you know, supports, you know, HTTP2. That was something that we built and now is part of uh, industry standards. Uh, it supports Quick, which is not yet an industry standard, but it's going through the IETF. And of course, you know, it's supported by Chrome and Mozilla. And we have open libraries if you want to build your own app. And uh, we have measurements that show that, you know, we have industry-leading uh, performance in both latency, availability, and throughput. So more of that coming later. OK. So what does our you know, CDN uh, look like? So, at a particular metro, um, we have a layer of packet forwarders uh, where traffic is coming uh, into our network. 
the, the name for those packet forwards is maglev. There is a very good SIGCOM paper from 2016 that describes the behavior. Uh, maglevs can do multiple millions of packets per second. They don't have to do a lot. What they have to do is you know, figure out where the right destination for a particular packet is and you know, send it you know, there. Typically, it's right next to them, but not always. I'll get more to that later. Then we have our L1 proxy. Uh, that is essentially the caching proxy that you know, sits at the edge of the network. There is three layers of cache sitting right next to that L1 proxy. Uh, there is an in-memory cache for the hottest possible you know, part of the content. Uh, that tends to you know, be on the order of you know, single digits of terabytes, only used for something that is extremely uh, hot that uh, needs to be served you know, at very, very high rate. There is what we call medium cache. Uh, that is on the order of triple digits of you know, terabytes. Depends on the location. Demand isn't always the same for all locations uh, on the internet. It's based on flash. Uh, we use it very heavily for you know, small contents that are very latency sensitive, but also you know, some big content that you know, ends up being hot enough to merit promotion to this cache. And then there is finally what we call large cache, which is based on spinning disk. Uh, that is typically you know, on the double-digit orders of petabytes. Um, it was built with you know, YouTube in mind. We need a cache that you know, gives us you know, 98, 99% you know, hit rate on you know, YouTube, so it had to be you know, fairly large to accommodate that. This you know, uh, hierarchy of caches is what's being made available to our cloud customers. The L1 proxies you know, will obviously you know, look things up in their you know, local cache hierarchy to see if you know, it's available. If not, then they will actually go back to you know, the instances you know, that have the original content. Depending on the kind of instance, there may be another layer of caching, uh, is what we call a shield cache. Um, not all origins you know, require that. For instance, if your origin happens to be Google Cloud Storage, Google Cloud Storage is a fairly big system in itself. It does not need protection. So there, the L1 proxies will go to it directly, but if you're running your you know, single VM, for instance, there will be a layer of caches that you know, would aggregate you know, requests coming from the first layer so that you, know, you don't get hammered. Uh, how do we build this? These are actually pictures uh, of racks out in the field. Uh, so the way we build it is uh, we have a very modular you know, horizontal uh, architecture. So, uh, what we do if we want to augment a particular location, we just add another rack, uh, which both increases you know, storage, since you know, racks are uh, integrated storage and egress uh, uh, bit pumps, and it increases you know, our egress capability. Uh, we tend to upgrade our machines uh, when they hit utilization of about 70%, and you know, we have a fairly sophisticated logistics program to make sure that just-in-time uh, augmentations happen you know, correctly. And the limiting factor here is the breadth of you know, network care. So those machines plug at you know, uh, routers or switches at the edge of the network. So the breadth of, those, you know, of, of that gear is one of the limiting factors. And it is one of the things that you know, forced us you know, to do work. So uh, up until a few years ago, uh, we were using you know, regular routers you know, as sold by you know, people like you know, Cisco, Juniper, possibly others. But what we were observing was that the port density on those was increasing uh, slower than the traffic was increasing. And uh, we were limited both by cost and scalability if we would continue to use that technology. So we kind of looked at them and said, you know, what does a router do? Well, you know, it does BGP. Uh, it exchanges information, routing information with the rest of the internet. It does packet forwarding. When it gets a packet, it knows how to send it to the you know, right final destination. It does ACLs. So Packets that are not supposed to go out to the internet or are not supposed to come into our network from the internet get dropped at that point. And it does this in a not very effective you know, uh, packaging uh, from a cost perspective. So we wanted to take all those things and you know, put them together into something that you know, would be uh, both more scalable and cheaper. So the solution to that is a system that we call Espresso. Uh, full paper on Espresso has been published in this year's you know, SIGCOM uh, for anybody that was interested. Uh, Espresso comes you know, with three parts. Uh, the first is a peering fabric. The peering fabric is effectively a switch. It's, uh, it has no routing uh, smarts in it. It just knows how to connect you know, sort of our side of the network to the rest of the internet. Um, 
It's much cheaper because you know it doesn't have all these extra capabilities you know the routers do, and uh, it is much more dense. You can get about 10x the number of ports on a switch than you can get on a router. So now that you have this switch, you need uh, some way to you know ship traffic you know through it. So what we have is we have moved all of the stuff in software. So we run our own BGP listener on the servers that are sitting on the edge uh, to get you know the routes you know from the other side, and we pass that information. Uh, to our mapping system, and I will explain how that you know, works. We run two layers of controllers, a global controller that determines where traffic is supposed to go, and that global controller produces assignments about once a minute, which it ships to the servers, and it tells them, for this particular you know, destination, I need you to send it out to that switch on that port, and you know, we have uh, mechanisms implemented you know, using GRE and PLS that allow us uh, to do that you know, with the switches that we have. And we have a local controller that essentially reacts on the order of seconds, routes on the internet come and go, somebody may withdraw a route, they might say, you know, I can't you know, be reached at this point from this particular location. The local controller is the one that's supposed to you know, take that information and say, okay, you know, where else can I send it until the global controller can compute a more optimized uh, assignment you know, for that destination. And uh, all of the packet processing that you know, the routers you know, were doing has moved you know, to the CPUs. Earlier, I showed you a, a picture of something that we called Maglev that was doing packet processing uh, on the incoming side. Maglev has been exp extended and now can, it has a different internal name. It can do packet processing on both the incoming and the outgoing side so we can send the packets you know, to the right destination. So um, logistics. Um, the difficulty here comes from the fact that you know, we're running a very large fleet in you know, many places. Um, we have about 5% of our machines you know, in some kind of you know, repair need at any point in time. And you know, this requires you know, active management for a fleet that has tens of thousands of servers. If you were to do that manually, that would be a very high you know, burden to you know, our operation side. So we've taken extensive you know, effort to automate all of this you know, work, including you know, upgrades, installations, and repairs. Um, all of that work happens you know, through a portal uh, where we uh, meet with our ISP partners. And you know, we, through that portal, you know, have workflows that allows us to do you know, dozens of turnups every week, uh, dozens of repairs every week, and in more than 90% of those, uh, no Googler actually has to touch uh, anything. It's all automated. So a machine gets shipped. You know, it gets connected you know, either by uh, a contract worker or by the ISP themselves. And then from that point on, uh, the system automatically you know, takes over. It you know, logs into the machine, installs the right software, you know, brings up the BGP session, you know, assigns it, you know, brings it you know, into the mapping system, and you know, traffic you know, starts flowing. And it knows how to do that actually in a smart way so that you know, traffic gets you know, brought up gradually so that we don't overwhelm you know, sort of the backbone networking you know, filling a very large cache you know, with a very large you know, workload. So peering. Um, this is one of the key benefits of you know, working you know, with Google. We have invested very heavily uh, with our ISP partners uh, to make sure that we have the best possible reachability. Um, a lot of the time, people think of a CDN and they think it is an issue of machine capacity. Yes, machine capacity matters, but you know what we find is that machine capacity is something that typically you know f is controlled by us. You know, we get to you know ship the machines, we get to install them. Uh, it, it, it's it's an easier problem to solve than something that requires an, you know an interlocutor on the other side. You know, bringing up additional peering with a partner means that both you and them. Uh, you know, have to be uh, in agreement, and you know, you have to coordinate. So, for peering, uh, we actively manage and forecast our peering, you know, demand. So, we actually look at, you know, what we think we're going to need, you know, with the partners, you know, not just, you know, over the next three months, but over the next three years, and we communicate all of that information to them, uh, you know, through the portal, and we tell them that, you know, this is the location where we see the traffic is coming to you. Uh, we think you know we need augment. We think we're going to need the augment you know this many months you know from now. We aim to have a one hop distance to 98% of all ISPs on the internet, and those tend to be you know the most major ones. 
And we aim to have multiple paths into each one of those ISPs. So we are not content in having just one place where we can connect with them. We want to connect to them in as many places as possible. For the big ones, that's actually fairly easy. They understand the value of doing that. Um, the, the, they see it you know, for their own you know, benefit, because uh, if you can connect in multiple places, then you can give them content close to their users so they don't have to use their own backbone you know, to uh, move that content around. Uh, for the smaller ones, sometimes you know, we have to find alternate paths you know, through transit providers since they might not be able to meet us in more than one location. And uh, we use our mapping system to you know, actively manage you know, those connections uh, and stir the traffic to the right uh, connection at any point in time. All right, the mapping system. Okay, so what is the mapping problem here? So the mapping problem is that we have multiple paths to every user just because of the way we're building the system. We have billions of users that you know we need to accommodate. Uh, thankfully, those billions of users can usually be subdivided to groups, so you don't have to deal with each one of them individually, although we, we try to, I'll, I'll say more about that later. So, but still, millions of user groups and demand capacity and congestion you know, changes in real time. So you need a system that can deal with all those constraints. So what do we have to do? We essentially have to generate an assignment of users to sites and links. Remember here, it's not enough to just send something to a particular location. You also have to know exactly which links, since you know, we're peering with multiple ISPs in that one location, are going to get used for uh, this particular user. You have to respect the available capacity of the machines and the network, so the supply is often greater than, it has to be greater than uh, the demand, which is not always true. You have to respect the peer preferences. Our peers, our ISPs partners, you know, give us policy that they want us to enforce. They say that, you know, I want, you know, this particular, you know, set of users to be served from here, this other particular set of users to be, you know, be served from, you know, some other place. We want to minimize cost and we want to maximize quality, you know, pursuant to those constraints. So, what does the mapping system, you know, look like? Um, there's a number of inputs. Obviously, we get you know, BGP and all the other routing data. This essentially tells us uh, where the users are, you know, how far away they are from you know, any one point in network distance. Network distance is number of hops, not necessarily you know, what the latency is between you know, sort of that location where the user is or you know, what the throughput is between that location and the user. We augment that you know, with our own observations of latency. As we serve users, you know, we collect information. We constantly you know, run a small trickle of users to other locations, what we call spraying, so that we can see how you know, the ideal location according to BGP compares you know, with other ones. Uh, the network topology, we have built our own model for both you know, sort of our network and you know, what the internet looks like. We actually have a fairly sophisticated model for all major ISPs. We share it with them. And we tell them where we see bottlenecks, not only, you know, sort of, I mean, not on our side that, you know, we keep internally and we fix, but we also tell them when we see bottlenecks on, you know, their side and we work with them, you know, to, to fix it. One of the things that um, was published like a few years back was the user score. Uh, this is like a YouTube, you know, number that tells uh, users and ISPs, you know, what their score is in terms of, you know, sort of for video consumption. Uh, we actually spent a good, you know, a couple of quarters working with the ISPs before we made it available to end users to make sure that they had every opportunity to fix their networks and improve, you know, the quality and the score that they would get on this before we made it available to the world. Uh, and obviously load reports, you know, we want to know how much traffic is going in any one place. So then the system um, starts, you know, with uh, a link and machine limit, limit, you know, computation. It determines, you know, what are the capacities and the demand in, you know, sort of every one of those elements. It you know, does a preliminary candidate selection. So it says, okay, you know, sort of for this particular user, it looks like you know, not the whole world uh, as a good choice you know, for where to assign them to, but here's you know, the top three or four or five you know, choices. And then that is fed you know, to an optimizer. The first you know, sort of parts of the system are you know, eager uh, um, algorithms. Um, 
which agree, greedy algorithms, which you know simply you know sort of do you know best guesses for you know what those are. The optimizer is a far more complicated you know piece of uh, code. It does linear programming to try and find you know sort of the optimal solutions, and we're trying to minimize you know sort of the size of the input data so that it can run you know within a one minute interval. Uh, we hope to produce those assignments about once a minute, uh, so that you know we can shift you know traffic around in ch response to you know changing demand from the internet. Uh, for safety reasons, uh, we archive every single one of the outputs of all of those you know, subsystems. If you know, at any point in time something goes wrong, we want to be able to restore the system to a sane state and say, okay, you know, we're not quite sure what is going on, but here's an assignment that you know, worked fine you know, 15 minutes ago. You know, please use that and you know, move forward. And finally, you know, we actually push that to a system that does a uh, resolution of the user request and you know, gives them you know, the location that they should be going, that, uh, they should be going to. So uh, this is one area where we have um, deviated from you know, what many other CDNs do. Instead of you know, uh, relying on an indirection, which is you know, quite common of you know, users to resolvers, and then you know, sort of figuring out from the resolver where the user should be uh, assigned, uh, we rely on either direct integration with the player for the YouTube or on our Anycast uh, solution to know exactly who the client is and send them to the right location. So in the previous picture where I was showing the maglevs, what that you know, would look like is a request that arrives you know, from a user knows exactly the client IP for that user. We don't you know, need to know the resolver. The resolver is irrelevant. Everything goes always to the same IP anyway. So when the packet, the request packet, comes into our network, uh, it comes with a client IP, and you know, the forwarders look at it and determine, is the local machine the optimal machine you know, to serve this piece of content? Uh, if the answer is yes, then you know, it's simply a handoff you know, sort of on the local machine. But some fraction of the time, that is not the case. You know, the mapping system has determined, but another cache is uh, better suited for serving this content. It will then take that packet and forward it to you know, that other cache and responses then come out direct. So the, the response is asymmetric you know, to the request, so the response will go out from a port that is closest you know, to this user as far as the mapping system you know, was able to determine. So um, I, I already spoke you know, the first few bullets on you know, this slide. There's some additional enhancements that we put into the mapping system to uh, you know, make it perform as well as possible. One is a dynamic estimation of uh, path limits, what we call end-to-end -end limits. Um, what that feature does is it tries to determine for any group of users what is the capacity of the internet between you know, sort of a cache and you know, where the end user lies. Uh, the way it does that actually is we, we have observed that you know, the internet has a one level of performance you know, when it is lightly loaded, which is very easy to determine because you know, it happens at trough times. In the middle of the night, there's not too many people you know, trying to use those connections. So it's never zero. There's always someone. Um, and you know, so I think the ratio between trough and peak is you know, sort of two to one or so. So there's still a lot of demand you know, at all times of the, the day and night. But because it's so much lower, you, know, you can sort of assume that the network is unburdened and the performance that you're observing at that point in time is indicative of a system that you know, is operating at its best you know, capability. So then you know, what we do is we constantly you know, sort of observe you know, the throughput and the latency that you know, we're seeing uh, at peak times. And if we're starting to see that it is deviating from that you know, optimal observation that you know, we've seen you know, at trough times, then we kick in you know, sort of the uh, algorithm that you know, spreads that load to you know, other paths. Uh, and we measure those other paths as well so that you know, we get you know, an equalized level of performance across all the paths. There's no point, yes, sir. Yes, so night in one part of the world is day in another uh, part of the world, so how do you suppress noise? Uh, the reality is that assignments are localized, so an Indian user will be sent to an Indian you know, location, and a you know, US user will be sent to a US location, so night and day there are very different, and the measurement is actually relative to the users that are supposed to that local location as opposed to somebody who's coming from the other side of the world. So, and another big you know, thing that you know, we do is we try to tell the users apart. Not every user has the same capability. You know, the announcements that we get from the internet uh, are coming in these large blocks that we call CIDR blocks. 
so oftentimes, you know, sort of an ISP will say, hey, you know, here is, you know, half a million or, you know, a couple of million users, you know, please route them, you know, sort of this way for me. And the reality is those are not always the same set of users. They don't have the same capabilities. So we constantly observe, you know, for each user what the capability has, what the capability is, and we try to divide them in smaller groups so that, you know, we can assign them independently rather than, you know, treating them as one big lamp uh, based on how the ISP, you know, as, uh, advertises them to us. Uh, so um, what we've seen, as we know, we've been working on the mapping system and in, uh, improving it. Um, we have reduced the amount of, you know, backbone usage, like the traffic that, you know, has to go from a particular cache to, you know, another exit point from about 10% uh, originally down to zero now. Uh, we managed to reduce our miss rate by properly assigning requests to the right uh, rack from about 4% to 2%. And uh, we had one other feature in our system, which is if the mapping system kind of screws up, the caches are allowed to defend themselves by redirecting you know, some traffic away. So this is only used for YouTube, which has a very, very large demand. We don't use the redirect feature for cloud CDN and our cloud customers, obviously, because we don't control you know, their client. And a redirect may end up being you know, harmful for them. But because YouTube is such a large part of the CDN, you know, sort of being able to redirect that traffic away leaves room for everybody else. So, and you know, modeling you know, sort of the machines and the disk capacities, we're able to reduce you know, the redirect rate from 3% to 1%. And uh, this mapping system actually matters. On the ingress side, we find that you know, if you just rely on BGP, you know, which is the closest hop, about 14, 15% of the traffic would land in a place that would not give you optimal performance. So being able to take these incoming requests and forward them to the right cache actually makes a different, not for you know, the most of the traffic, but a good enough chunk of the traffic to matter. So here's actually some small performance results of you know, turning on the, uh, the aggregation and end-to-end you know, -end limits. You know, it's experiments you know, showing rebuffer rate and retransmit rates. You can see market you know, uh, increases uh, in, decreases in retransmit rate uh, and uh, reductions in you know, rebuffer rate you know, when we turn those things on. So uh, now that I've actually you know, covered a little bit you know, on the technical, I want to go a, a bit more on the product philosophy. You know, what is it that we're trying to achieve you know, with our cloud CDN? So first of all, I want to say that you know, we are partners. Uh, we're a cloud company, first and foremost, not a CDN company. So, Yes, we build our own CDN because we want to offer our customers a one-stop shop. If they want to buy something from us and have it all you know, work seamlessly and easy, then they should be able to do that. At the same time, we fully understand that many of our customers that are coming to our cloud already have existing relationships or they want features that you know, we are not offering yet. So we have a large number of partners and we expect that we will continue for the indefinite future to have a large number of CDN partners. And our customers are free to choose, you know, sort of us, them, a combination. Many of them want to be multi-vendor. Um, that should continue to be the case uh, for the indefinite future. However, we want to make ours as easy to use, and we hope that you know customers, you know, will see the value of you know uh, sticking with a one-stop uh, shop and you know pick us. Uh, obviously, you know, sort of. This decision rests you know, with uh, the customers, uh, but we're making it as you know, easy to use as possible. Here is actually the configuration. After you have a back end, you can see that the enable CDN button is just a single checkbox. So once you've configured a back end inside Google, if you want to enable caching, you know, the configuration is about as trivial as it gets. Any other integration will surely you know, be more complicated than that, I guarantee it. Uh, we offer easy management, you know, log delivery inside the cloud, and you know, performance statistics all in the same you know, Pantheon view, uh, where you will actually go and configure uh, your CDN and your other backends. So again, you know, if you are used to you know, having uh, an, uh, a partnership you know, with Google, you are actually using our other products, you're familiar with our tools, the same set of familiar tools you know, will be used to you know, visualize and control you know, your CDN and the things that it generates. Um, we've been adding features to it. Uh, so we're sort of late starters in this game. We initially focused very heavily on infrastructure because we were building something for internal use. 
And now that you know we're externalizing, you know, the sort of the CDN, we are finding that our customers want more things than you know what Google needed internally. So we've added support for custom cache keys. So if you decide that you know you don't want your whole URL to be a key, then you can select pieces of it. We've added support for signed URLs. This is something that many of our customers have asked, you know, for more secure delivery. Uh, we are partnering with another cloud. Um, product that we have called Anvado to support live streaming if, it is, if this is something that you want to do. Or you can just do live streaming you know, in your own way, but if you want a package solution, you know, then we have a full integration with Anvado. Uh, obviously, V6 support, that wasn't specific to the CDN, but you know, once we did it you know, for all cloud, you know, CDN got it for free. Uh, User-defined header insertion, many of our customers have asked for that, so we support you know, certain sets of headers that you know, can be inserted into the requests. Um, you can support multiple certs and you know, managed you know, certs uh, as part of our CDN offering. Uh, TLS cipher selection, very important for compliance. You know, some customers you know, only want to use particular SSL ciphers. Uh, we give them the option of selecting which ones they want. Content takedown, that's a, you know, obviously a feature that every CDN needs to have. Customers sometimes make mistakes. They put up content that they don't want to put up. If it's out in the caches, you need to you know, be able to get rid of it. And finally, one of the you know, more recent things, which uh, is going GA you know, sort of next week, it has been announced you know, for a while now, it's in open beta, is what we call large object media support. You know, our, our origins are in video, and uh, it was one of the things that you know, our Cloud CDN customers were complaining was even though we had great infrastructure for video, our initial implementation for Cloud CDN uh, had a limitation on object size that has been taken away. There's been a few things that, you know, had to happen. Um, because video content tends to be fairly large, we don't want to fetch it all in one fell soup into the cache. So we uh, chunk it into you know, smaller pieces and you know, we fetch the piece that is necessary based on you know, what is being requested you know, from the uh, user side. There is one contract that we need to have between us and the uh, customer. The customer has to guarantee to us that they have an origin that supports you know, range requests and you know, will actually tell us what the size of the object is uh, when we first you know, do a range request. Um, as we've been deploying it, I think we found like about 0.01% of our customers doesn't actually have compliant origins. It is surprising that they don't, but uh, we've disabled you know, the feature for those uh, customers who are working with them to fix it. And this is the thing that you know, has delayed us slightly in you know, declaring GA. We want to make sure that you know, nobody gets harmed uh, in the process of rolling this out. So uh, a, a next talk wouldn't be interesting if without announcing some things that should come you know, down uh, the pike. So the number one thing that you know, we've seen is uh, our customers are saying that it's great that you have a CDN. It's great that it works so well with Google Cloud. But you know what? We have assets that live outside of Google Cloud. And most of them you know, are talking about their on-prem assets. And they're saying, you know, we need support for that. And some of them are saying, OK, and we also want multi-cloud. We want to be able to run you know, some stuff on you and some stuff on your competitors. And maybe we'd like to use your CDN you know, regardless of you know, where our origins are sitting. Uh, so we are working in you know, bringing that uh, to uh, Cloud CDN. Uh, I'm hoping that by sometime, you know, end of this year, we'll have something to announce. The other big thing that I announced, you know, sort of earlier is we're working in extending our Cloud CDN to the off-net uh, fleet that we have. The difficulty there is primarily, you know, how do you do any cast off-net? You know, you don't control the network like you do when you're inside, you know, the Google environment. We think we have a solution. We're working with our ISP partners to allow us to, you know, do this any cast uh, solution. They are very incentivized uh, to work with us. They want to have you know, the traffic that you know, Cloud CDN you know, generates come from the off-net caches. They would rather not have it come through peering for those that have an off-net caches. So we think we, uh, we have the good working relationship that you know, would allow this to happen. Um, integration with Cloud Armor, this is a completely separate product, but it is uh, part of the security suite. You know, people want to be able to set uh, both, you know, sort of blocking rules for particular IPs or countries or, you know, protection for uh, uh, SQL injection or cross scripting or other things. So we have support uh, for that. It is now supported, you know, sort of uh, at the LB layer. We're working on extending it, you know, sort of to the caching layer. Uh, the, the product has already been announced. It is in, I think, alpha or beta. Uh, forgive me for not remembering exactly. Um, 
One other optimization that we're trying to add for customers, especially you know, uh, those that want to do uh, live events with you know, very, very low latency is the uh, assume public content uh, for optimizing this rate. Right now, what the CDN does is when it gets a request, um, it doesn't know whether the you know, response is going to be cacheable or not. It cannot know until you know, sort of the origin has responded because the information is available in the headers. So because it has to be conservative and it doesn't want to introduce latency, when it gets, you know, sort of, say, three requests for the same thing, it has to forward them all to the origin at the same time uh, in order to make sure that, you know, they don't get delayed. Um, under, you know, this mode, a customer would guarantee that uh, the content is always cacheable. So then, you know, you can forward just the first request and leave all of the other ones, you know, sort of waiting for the first answer to come. And then you can, you know, get that answer back to, you know, all the users that have been waiting. Um, and, you know, finally, you know, we're working with Envato to, you know, build an end-to-end -end, uh, low latency live video support system. Uh, we have, you know, internal demonstrations uh, which shows that, you know, we can go from encoder to, you know, final serving in low single digit, you know, seconds. We're hoping to make that available to our cloud customers as well. Performance. We have a very extensive uh, set of evaluations for um, how well we're doing. The probably most important one is the one that we share with our ISP partners because that helps us not only you know, sort of improve our site, but it helps you know, them improve their site as well. So this is an example of an ISP partner, ASN 7018. Um, and for those of you who are in this business should know who that partner is. And what we do is we capture a small fraction of all packets, as we know, we send them down, and we analyze you know, sort of those packets, both on the outgoing you know, side and on the incoming side, to detect you no know, bottlenecks. So uh, we also insert you know, some packets, you know, duplicate packets you know, with reduced TTLs, so we can see you know, sort of where they reach you know, the network on the other side and how long it takes for the ICMP expire uh, to come back. And all that goes into sort of an analysis system that determines you know, what the bottlenecks in the communication are. So this is an example, you know, the system auto uh, adjusts and essentially takes the worst possible path and assigns that to be, you know, uh, the, you know, reddest part of the spectrum. Uh, in this particular case, the reddest part of the spectrum is still, you know, eight megabits per second, as you can see from, you know, the slider above. Uh, so this is a very well-provisioned ISP, not one that has bottlenecks. Every user is getting a still at least, you know, eight megabits per second, which is more than good enough for, you know, even Ultra HD. But we have that for every ISP partner. We have thousands of them, and we share that information with them constantly, and you know, we help you know, build you know, better connectivity for us and also you know, for them. Yes, sir? Is there a publicly published paper or a data set? Um, no, this is not a publicly available data set. It is available to ISP partners. If any of you are an ISP or a telco, then you can sign up to the portal and get your own information. Uh, unfortunately, you know, for various reasons, we cannot tell one ISP information about what other ISPs are doing. Internal evaluations are great. Um, the reality is that, you know, we trust them more than we trust anything externally, but I, you know, we fully understand that uh, the people that, you know, want to use our CDN don't necessarily have to take our word on, you know, how well we're performing. So we've commissioned a study uh, from an external partner, Sedexis in this case. Sedexis has you know, this fairly interesting system where they have clients around the world living inside people's you know, browsers or apps. And what they do is you know, they've convinced a whole bunch of you know, websites to allow them to install a bit of JavaScript you know, sort of on their website. And after you know, the website has finished loading, that JavaScript which belongs to Sedexis can kick off measurements uh, against, you know, sort of any of a number of destinations and see, you know, how well, you know, uh, those destinations are performing. So uh, it's, it's a very interesting measurement system. It's got millions of vantage points or tens of millions of vantage points around the world. And it's very difficult to optimize for because the requests are coming from everywhere. So it's essentially a depiction of the internet. Um, uh, Sedexis is actually publishing those reports. There is like a, a much fuller list of all the CDNs. 
this is a cloud conference, so I'm actually presenting the results for our biggest you know, cloud competitor, AWS and CloudFront. But uh, all the results for all CDNs, including our own, you know, can be found in that URL. I encourage you to go and click on the link and you know, look at them for yourself. Uh, we have results for latency. We have results you know, for throughput. Uh, the, the early part of the graph that was actually a problem, like a small downside, uh, downtime in the Sodexi side. So for a couple of days, the data was missing, uh, but then you know, sort of the graph comes back up. Uh, and availability. Uh, so one interesting thing to note here is you can tell that this is a real internet-based measurement. Availability is actually pretty bad. It's about 99%. You know, you know, if you look at you know, sort of the guarantees that you, know, you get from almost every CDN, it's like you know, multiple nines, including ourselves. You know, we promise four nines. But we promise four nines on the availability of the caches. The internet is a very nasty place, and this includes you know, people that are sitting behind you know, broken Wi-Fi's at their homes, or they turn the microwave on you know, when you know, the measurement you know, happens to you know, be going on. So the failures that you're seeing here is a sort of the real effects of what happens you know, sort of out there in the world. You still need the four nines in the cache to get that. If you didn't have those four nines in the cache level, you'd be getting something worse than that. And that's where you, know, you see some separation you know, between the CDNs. The biggest contributor to you know, what you're seeing is you know, what happens outside on the internet, but the CDNs themselves actually uh, contribute to a certain extent as well. I have a small demo uh, on the benefits of CDN. So you know, we've configured you know, a backend. Uh, for the purposes of you know, this demo, we put this backend in India. So it's really far away from here. And you know, we have the origin. Uh, in, just for this demo, we made the origin you know, uh, publicly accessible so we can go to it directly. It is not you know, uh, blanketed from the internet. And here I've run some trace routes. I actually run them right before you know, I came in. Uh, you can see that you know, the origin is about 307 milliseconds away from here. And you know, the CDN IP that is caching the content is about four milliseconds away from here, which is pretty good. So, so here, side by side, on the left side, you have the CDN uh, site. It is you know, loading. And you can see you know, how fast it is. On the right side, you, know, you have you know, something coming you know, from the origin. You can see how much slower it is. Chrome has this very beautiful uh, feature. called you know, developer tools. And if you click on the network tab, you can actually see how long it takes you know, for this slide to show, this uh, uh, page to show. So on the CDN side, it takes about 300 milliseconds to load a page that has about 15 fairly large you know, images. Uh, this is a um, CDN configuration uh, that includes you know, Quick, uh, so it's our best protocol you know, for loading, uh, persistent connections. Uh, the you know, right-hand side is sort of an origin that is going over HTTP 1.1. Uh, so it, it, it's not really a fair comparison, but it's one that I you know, created to you know, showcase you know, the, the difference. I encourage you, you know, the slides will be available when you go back to your homes. Uh, click on the CDN you know, site, you know, run some trace routes. It'll be the same IP. You'll be able to see that it's always a few milliseconds away from you. With that, I'd like to you know, sort of summarize and say that you know, we focused on ease of use, security, and performance. I'm not going to repeat you know, the, the bullets. Those are you know, sort of the key aspects of the CDN that you know, we want to share with our customers. And I have an obligation to also tell you that there's a lot of you know, beautiful networking talks at Next. I encourage you to attend as many of them as you can and learn about you know, the great network that you know, Google Cloud has to offer. And since everybody likes you know, Schwag, if you want a beautiful poster, you know, nice glossy to put on your wall of you know, how great you know, the Google you know, network is, g.co slash poster, put your information and we'll happy to give you one. Thank you. <laughs>